Welcome to Sunday Edition. I'm Dennis Waltering. He's a real-life crime reporter who used his wit and charm and smarts to get more out of sources than most other reporters. And now the reporter a colleague described as the Times-Picayune's chief bloodhound has retired. And he'll tell us some of his stories. Welcome back. Columnist Angus Lynn wrote a great profile about crime reporter Walt Philbin in the Times-Picayune, calling his colleague the newspaper's chief bloodhound sleuthing around New Orleans murder scenes. It turns out that after more than 35 years of working police sources and investigating crime scenes himself, Walt Philbin has retired. And as Angus pointed out, Walt often got the most out of witnesses and sources because he would just kind of lay back until the media horde had left. Then he would quietly go to work questioning, commiserating, and coming away with the best information. Joining us now to talk about his career and his adventures, a reporter who has given his readers an education about crime in New Orleans, Walt Philbin. Walt, thanks for coming in. I appreciate it. Thank you. Dan. And first of all, what are some of the biggest stories you've covered in your career? Uh, probably for, uh, from the Joellen Smith murder case uh, in, in Algiers, where um, uh, a, a, an LSU school of nursing employee that was the daughter of a New Orleans assessor, Algiers assessor, was murdered and raped to um, the upstairs bar fire mm -hmm. uh, with Angus Lynn and Lanny Thomas, um, two uh, state's item reporters at the time. Um, I covered the uh, Adolf Archie uh, case. Uh, I covered a, a number of uh, murder, big murder cases. I'd Tell say. us about the Joe Ellen Smith case, because that, that really was um, a big case. It led to Joe Ellen Smith became the name of a hospital. That's right. Yeah. In the Joellen Smith case, uh, I, uh, my editor at the time, the state's item, uh, sent me over to the house because she had been missing for a few days. Uh, the fact is, uh, as part of the LSU School of Nursing curriculum, she had to go to the Fisher Project to teach a 90-year-old a uh, lady how to administer in insulin to herself. Mm -hmm. and the, but the lady had a, couldn't do it herself, it turned out. And a, a, a younger woman who lived with her, but who worked during the week, uh, actually uh, uh, was the one that Joellen Smith had to teach. So she went on weekends. And um, she took it on herself to do it, because she had to do it as part of the curriculum, but she wasn't supposed to go on weekends. And the, the, the whole fallout was, when she went there, there were two uh, uh, junkies, uh, Stephen Barry, a 16-year-old, and a, um, a Timothy Rudolph in his early 20s. They saw her with the bag she was carrying, grabbed her, and, and took her to a field about a mile away in a, a remote abandoned lot and raped and killed her. Wow. And it was days before anyone knew uh, the result. Uh, she, was, she was missing. And so I just happened to be going to the front door on a missing person case. And here I was, just six months a reporter at the most. Mm -hmm. uh, and I see Henry Morris, the old chief of detectives, passes me. And you know, Henry, he, he mumbled. You know, he didn't have much to say to us. Uh -huh. But he mumbled something that I later figured out was too late now. I didn't know that at the time. And when I went to the door, I say, uh, there's the mother, and I'm, I'm Walt Philbin with the state's item. Could I ask you a few questions? Well, uh, a neighbor justifiably jumps in front of her and says, well, how dare you uh, come to interview her when, when she's just found out that her, uh, that her daughter was found murdered. And, right. and, I, and so I said, excuse me, and I started to leave. I'm really sorry, I didn't know. And the father came out and said, I want you to know what the School of Nursing made my daughter do as part of the curriculum. Wow. And even if you have to sit there and watch my tears, I want to hear the, I want you to hear this. Because mm. later, the School of Nursing claimed that, like I say, she wasn't supposed to go on weekends. But still, the fact remains, she had to go right. in there. Anyway, so that, that's the And police the were often afraid to go into the Fisher house in front of Oh, yeah. Right? In fact, so. that first week, one of the stories we had, we went into the Fisher and interviewed Stephen Berry's mother. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people told us, yeah, that was very mm. unusual. You covered a lot of incredible stories, and, and you did have that technique of sort of laying back, didn't you? I mean, was that something yes. you thought about or just kind of came I, up with uh, as the time I, went on? I think it matches my, um, it came naturally to me. Uh -huh. uh, I, I think that some people are naturally non-threatening, and, and in, in newspapering or journalism, you have to sometimes be the non-threatening person and sometimes have to be the tough person person and I think I was always better at the non-threatening and I could go into a uh, scene or, or even a press conference mm -hmm. and even Harry Connick the DA would tell me look I know you're asking me four questions <laughs> just like whatever you're coming back 
but at least you're polite about it. <laughs> but, and you get more information that way, oftentimes. And they call me Columbo. People begin to call me Columbo. One more thing, one more question. Yeah. And how did you feel about that? Well, how did you see yourself? I, I kind of did. I, I thought I'm, I'm being given credit for, for being, you know, being real sharp. So, it, 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 you know, you give you time to, you know how always a journalist, you're always forgetting, oh, that one question I forgot. <laughs> so since I'm Columbo, it played, right. I had an excuse. <laughs> it kind of worked. <laughs> uh, you, you covered, I mean, the Pizza Kitchen murders, the Algiers 7, I would imagine. Oh, yeah. uh, I mean, how would you say crime has changed over the more than 35 years you covered uh, crime here um, in New Orleans? I, I think, well, I think that there was a period in the very beginning when I was first there in the 70s where, where it, before T's and Blues, the uh, tall women pyrobenzamine mixture that came from Chicago in the, about 79, where people could walk to corner to, to TV, you know, kids, they send their kids to like movie theaters uh -huh. and all with no problem. Uh, and I think the first problem about 79 when Pen when Parsons, the out of town uh -huh. chief Parsons. was there, happened to be there. And then uh, when crack cocaine came in like 85 to a, a little bit, uh, 80, through 80, 85 through the late 80s, I think you just, just saw a huge change so that by 94 when Pennington uh -huh. came, uh -huh. we were through the roof on murders. I think we've gone down, of course, but the problem is everybody else has gone down and we're coming up, not back to the 94 level, but certainly to unacceptable oh. levels. And, and so drugs have had a big impact. Yes. That, that's drug-related crime that's causing all of this. Yes. It, often it is um, the climate of, of drugs, the, the drug dealers who are killing each other often over manhood issues. Uh, right. I, I've got dissed, the old right. term. I was disrespected right. in front of all these people by this. Often it doesn't Often it's not just a ripoff. I mean, it is sometimes, mm -hmm. but it's often just that kind of thing. And once mm -hmm. that begins, mm -hmm. the revenge tree, mm -hmm. where the other person to protect, his, preserve his manhood, the brother of the victim has to come back just goes and back kill him. and forth, on and on. And you can almost predict who's going to get killed next. What about? I want to ask community policing. Is is that an important? Was that a helpful thing when we had that? It, it was, but a lot of people, uh, I think, think they say community policing, and they think, okay that'll be the answer, that's a strategy. The reason it works so well in New Orleans under Pennington is that we had the federal funds, the fe federal, a tremendous amount of federal funds backing it up at the time. Uh -huh. And a number of my sources, high, even high-ranking uh, officers uh, under Pennington, uh, acknowledged to me that late in the Pennington administration we were losing those federal funds. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't have um, let's say Eddie Compass, who was then later to become chief, he mm -hmm. was the head of the cops unit. You couldn't have him in the Desire, the Florida Project, with his, say, 15 guys here in the, in the B.W. Cooper, the Calliope, all the time. Right. You, you, the, the money ran out. Mm -hmm. The idea is great. The idea of actually getting with the people and even doing things like if they have a street light out, mm -hmm. being able to be a liaison to, mm -hmm. for them to call the city service uh, agency to maintain that services is great. But I think you have to have a lot of money behind it. Well, what are you doing now? Uh, I'm, I'm uh, trying to, right now during the holidays, I'm still in shock. <laughs> I, I take one I think I put a lot of, of us are in shock that you've retired. <laughs> well, I take one foot out of the bed and head toward the picayune, but then I slap myself. <laughs> uh, and I'm all, often doing things like, oh, I can't go out Friday night, I have the night shift, and then, I, what do you mean you have the night shift? <laughs> but, but I think I'm going to try to get some structure and, and write and write. I, I don't really have a, a novel in mind as such, but I'm going to start with stories or sketches. I look forward to reading what you write. Thanks, well, Walt. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. That's our program for this week. Thank you for joining us. Hope to see you again next week on Sunday Edition.